Okay, good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to this week's edition of the BPPB. Uh, so today we're going to have two awesome talks. Uh, the first one is by Katie Newhall, uh, who's going to tell us about uh, different relative scalings between transient forces and thermal fluctuations uh, and its relation to chromatin organization. Uh, so Katie, please take it away. Thank you. Um, it's my pleasure to be here and tell you about this work. Um, maybe I'll just start by saying a little bit about myself. Um, I actually started out as an experimental physicist in undergrad and then discovered I hated doing experiments and found my way to applied mathematics. Um, and so I now sit in the mathematics department um, and I'm very interested in stochastic systems. And so biology is this rich field of fluctuating things that are, that are fun to explore. Um, and so I'll tell you a little bit about that today. Um, so, so I'm going to talk about um, chromosomes, but this is sort of one piece in a larger picture of what happens in biology that if you go down to the to the small scale, there's a lot of times some kind of active agent um, that is using ATP to do something. Um, and so it's pushing the system out of equilibrium. Um, and a lot of times the, uh, the, what these active agents are doing is um, binding and unbinding some kind of transient force that's going on. Um, so maybe this is a, a molecular motor that's walking down a, down a tubular. Uh, maybe this is um, a condensin protein that binds two pieces of DNA in, in the chromosome and extrudes a loop. Uh, maybe this is uh, uh, some kind of polymer network that um, is trying to trap viruses. Um, and uh, maybe it's the, the, the polymer network itself that has some sort of cross-linking. Um, and so back when I was in high school, the picture of biology was always like this deterministic picture. The molecular motor is gonna walk down the tubular and like march down it. Um, if, if two things are going to bind, it's like chemistry, like they, they bind and they never let go of each other. And that's probably not actually an accurate picture. These things are, are binding and unbinding, um, but yet able to do their proper function. Um, and so that's sort of where I'm coming into this work of like how, not, not just how does the system overcome the fluctuations, but how are the fluctuations important for proper function? All right. So, so the experiment that expired that inspired this work came out of um, Carrie Bloom's lab here at UNC, um, where they are looking at uh, cr chromatin in the yeast uh, nucleus, um, and specifically in the the nucleolus, which is one of the uh, one of the strands of chromatin. Um, these blurry microscope images, you see sort of emerging structure out of this. So. Uh, 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 condensed blobs uh, inside the, the structure. Um, and it was only happening in this nucleolus. And the nucleolus is the only place that has um, some of these cross-linking forces that I'll tell you about in a minute. Um, so, I'm, so I'm modeling at the, at the level of chromatin, but trying to predict structure um, at uh, uh, sort of the more large scale um, and understand how the, how the DNA isn't just this bowl of wet floppy noodles, but maybe there's some additional structure in there. All right, um, so uh, Carrie Bloom's group, um, along with some students of Greg Forrest at UNC, built a, a, a large scale biological model of what was happening to the chromatin. So here's you see over here on the right, uh, four strands out of, out of all of the, the strands of chromatin um, confined inside of a hard wall of the nucleus. Um, and these strands, they modeled like a polymer, so a bead spring model. Um, and then this special piece of chromatin that's the nucleolus has these additional pink uh, cross-linking uh, uh, bindings from uh, the condensin protein. Uh, and so uh, each bead acts like it has one hand. Um, that hand can like go around and shake with somebody else. You can form a pairwise bond. It can't bo bond with anybody else. Um, and then we'll, we'll let go and maybe find somebody else to, to bond with. Um, and so with this model, they found that as they changed the time scale of this binding, which is something that's hard to measure experimentally. So do people um, bind and unbind really, really rapidly? 
they found that the beads condensed into these clusters um, and, and stuck around for a long time. Where the other end of the spectrum, where you have kind of this deterministic process, like you're going to shake hands and then never let go again, um, you just formed sort of pairs of beads that floated around in the soup and you didn't really get any structure. Um, but in, in some intermediate timescales, you got a third regime where you were able to form clusters, but it was fairly easy for a bead to leave a cluster or join a cluster or a cluster to split or for clusters to merge. Um, uh, and so you see that with the coloring of the beads in this picture, each cluster um, is colored um, using some kind of network analysis. That's not the point of this talk. Um, but the hypothesis for biology is that if the if the, if the if biology can tune the time scale of this binding, you could switch between these different regimes. You could solidify yourself into a nice organization, or you could allow some flexibility and allow the, the, the genome to sort of reorder itself. Um, and a, a different part of the genome could be available at different points in time during the cell cycle. Um, so, so that's where I come in is trying to understand um, this kind of um, uh, mechanism behind this um, and where the physics viewpoint comes in. Because I look at this um, and I see uh, the, the, the rigid clusters on the left as a low temperature system in a high energy barrier well, um, where the system on the right would be like a high temperature system or a low energy barrier well. Um, and so that's what um, the student Ben Walker and I set out to do was could we come up with some kind of effective equilibrium for the system that's out of equilibrium because of these stochastic binding and unbinding events of the of the protein. All right. Um, so so the first the first stage was to bring ourselves from this super large scale complicated model down to something that we could mathematically analyze. Um, and so the first step was uh, to reduce uh, just down to 361 beads that represented this nucleolus out of the entire uh, chromosome um, uh, model and uh, to try to sort of show the universality of, of this binding and unbinding mechanism. Um, so we got rid of the width of the chain. So we no longer have a polymer. We just have a bunch of free beads floating around that, that uh, uh, repulse each other if they get too close. Um, and a stochastically fluctuating bond. Um, and we implemented this in, in an entirely different way from uh, the large scale model um, and, and still showed that we had uh, these, these same three rearrangements, which are now on the slide in the opposite order. So the, the fast rigid clusters are, are on the right now and the amorphic no clusters, everybody just floating around is on the left. Um, uh, but there seems to be some universality to this uh, switching force producing some kind of effective equilibrium. All right, so what do, what do I what do I mean when I say say equilibrium or metastable states or things like this? Um, so uh, a, a thermal equilibrium would have something like a Boltzmann's or a Gibbs distribution, where you have um, maybe the Hamiltonian up here or some sort of uh, uh, energy here. We're just going to have potential energy. Um, and epsilon is uh, the, the mathematician's temperature. Uh, and so a mathematical model like the overdap Langevin equation would sample that thermal equilibrium um, distribution in time. Uh, and if you had multiple minimizing states, then the energy barrier between those states would predict the, the lifetime uh, of staying in one of those states. Um, so if your if your thermal energy, if your temperature epsilon is much smaller than the energy barrier, um, then this this probability distribution is concentrated around the minimums. You spend a lot of time there, and you have these rare events to go over the the barrier. Um, and so what that looks like as a plot in time is shown on the right here, uh, where you you hang out by one of the minimums for a long time, then you make this fast transition to one of the other minimums. Um, and and the, the mean time is pro exponentially proportional to that energy barrier. Okay, so that's so that's the, the, the framework that I'm going to work with. Um, and along with the time for the transition, one can also come up with the path 
the most probable path that the system takes to get from one of those minimums to the other. Um, so up here on the right, you see the energy contours of constant energy. So the, the, the darker blues are some local minimums. Um, and by evolving these, these white points based on the gradient of the energy, um, you can evolve into this most probable path. Um, so this is the string method that was developed uh, by Eric van der Deyden, who I worked with while I was at um, Karat. Uh, okay, so, so let's, let's reduce ourselves down even further to a model that we can try to put into that framework. Um, uh, so now uh, uh, this was the three beads was the smallest number of beads that we could think of where we could have some kind of cluster and changing between clusters. Um, so a, a cluster is going to be two beads nearby and one bead far away. Um, and those two beads are nearby, not because they are bound to each other, but because they're binding and unbinding, but they don't get too far away from each other. Um, and so this plot in the middle should look a little bit like the uh, the plot two slides ago, uh, where I'm plotting the pairwise distance between beads. Um, so you see here like a big swath of red, uh, meaning that the blue and pink bead were nearby each other for a long amount of time while they were binding and unbinding. And then there's a quick transition, um, and then maybe the green and blue bead were by each other for a long time. Um, so what's nice about only using three beads is you can um, enumerate all the states that the system uh, lives in. So you can have everybody unbound, one and two bound to each other, one and three bound to each other, two and three bound to each other. Um, and so mathematically, you can write down these binding and unbinding events as transitions between those four states with a continuous time Markov chain. Um, so what you have is, is a, a stochastic differential equation um, up the top here that where the drift term is this fluctuating force based on what state of the Markov chain you're in. Um, and then the state of the Markov chain, you want closer beads to be more likely to bind because the protein has some length. And so it's more likely to bind two things together that are close. And so you have a Markov chain whose rates depend on the state of the system. So You have that coupling going back and forth between the two. Um, and so now what we wanna do is come up with this effective equilibrium. So we want to find the steady state. And so the steady state um, is where the, um, the Fokker-Planck equation is equal to zero. Um, and so the box on the, on the left is uh, the, the Fokker-Planck equation for each individual stochastic differential equation given that you're in state S. And then um, those states get coupled by the Markov chain. OK. And so the idea is to look for something that looks like um, a, a, a thermal equilibrium kind of steady state distribution um, for this system. Now, where the three different regimes of behavior come in is how um, the relative scaling of the thermal fluctuations controlled by epsilon in the box on the left um, and the how fast the switching rates are, which is controlled over here on the box in, in the right. Um, and so depending on how uh, the mathematician scales these with, with epsilon, um, dictates which terms show up in highest order in the, the perturbation analysis when you look for this effective thermal equilibrium. Um, so, so there's there's three main regimes. So one where beta is greater than one, so say zero, so no dependence on, uh, sorry, beta equals equals two, um, where the, so the switching rates are, are exceedingly fast. They're much faster than, than, than the thermal fluctuations. Um, and so that pushes the, the Markov chain part of the equation into the highest order. Um, and you look for just the equilibrium of the Markov chain. And then at the next order, the forces just get averaged over that equilibrium. And that's what you would expect if you just did standard time averaging. Um, and so what drops out of this is, is nothing that depends on the time scale of the switching. This just says the switching acts like a deterministic force and you just average over what state you're in on average. Um, the next, so if beta equals one, 
Um, that's when you get a balance between the switching and the thermal fluctuations and both terms show up in the highest order. Uh, and uh, um, I've got some more math on the next slide, um, but that's where you, you get concentrations from both of these and you get an effective um, equilibrium that depends on the time scale. Um, and so then uh, if, if beta is between, between zero and one, um, then the switching is very slow. Um, and so you're going to switch to a state, the system's going to equilibrate in that state, you're going to switch to another state, the system's going to equilibrate in that state. Um, and so this is where the, the, the amorphic configurations come from. Um, the, the switching forces aren't able to produce the clusters, they aren't able to produce uh, an effective force that's anything different than any one of the forces that they're, that they're in. All right, so a little bit more expansion on, on the pink box. Uh, at, at highest order, you have basically all the terms. Um, so you've got contribution from the, the diffusion, uh, contribution from the, the advection or the drift A, um, and contribution from the switching matrix. Uh, uh, and so there's this theory of quasi-potentials uh, that, that says um, when, you, when you look for this quasi-potential, uh, you can also look for most probable paths that are parallel to the gradient of this quasi-potential. And so you can get the, the mean transition times with this quasi-potential, just like you did with the, the thermal equilibrium. Um, and and so, so numerically, what this means is rather than knowing the gradient and evolving the path, knowing the gradient, um, you can you, you have to iterate back and forth. So you pick a path. Now you have to solve for the quasi-potential along the path, then use the path, the, the quasi-potential to update the path, then find a new quasi-potential along the path um, and, and continue that, that evolution. Um, great. So, okay, so what do you end up with? So, so, the, time, the, so the time averaging is not completely useless. Uh, the time averaging does predict clusters, um, and and you can ex explore those fixed points um, and look for for the states. So you end up with two energy uh, uh, or effective energy minimizing states: a two bead cluster with two beads nearby and one far away, and a three bead cluster, um, and then some transition points in in between those. Um, but we also really what we like to do is understand how long it takes uh, for the chromosomes to make these transitions. Um, and so that's where the quasi potential comes in. The quasi potential, um, uh, when all of the terms interact, um, predict all these different transition paths. Um, uh, and then uh, uh, you can look at the energy barrier along one of them. Okay, so let me explain what's going on uh, in this top left plot. Uh, so on, so on the right. So this is um, the the transition shown here in the upper left here, where I'm going two beads. The pink bead is leaving, so the pink bead is on the way to join the blue bead and form a different cluster. Um, so that's the the transition that's shown here from the minimum to um, this this transition point, the saddle point. Um, and the the dashed line is what is predicted if you did the time averaging and then looked for the quasi potential for the time averaging, where the colored lines are um, different constant scalings of the transition matrix. Um, so going um, from from fast yellow to a little bit slower um, down to the slowest here in black and red. Um, and so what this says is if you just use the, the time averaging, yes, you'd predict clusters, um, but you'd over predict the stability of the clusters if your system wasn't operating in that regime. Um, and that uh, uh, by considering this, this interaction of the fluctuations from the stochastically switching force and the thermal fluctuations already present, you, you give the system a boost of being able to transition. Um, so the thought experiment there is that um, if you had, say, like an infinitely deep well, on average, you would never be able to escape it if you just did a time averaging. Um, but if that well was flashing on and off, if while it was off, you were able to diffuse out of it, 
um, then that would that would aid and it would look as if you had a, a lower barrier well um, because you were able to escape while while the fluctuation was happening. All right. Um, okay, so to, to, to summarize all of that, there are um, these, these three regimes uh, that were seen both experimentally and in large scale numerical simulations um, where there were, were clusters with very long lifetimes. There were clusters that were able to more flexibly exchange members um, and exchange their configurations. Um, and then there was no clustering um, just pairwise um, amorphic state floating around. And this was a, a function of the binding and unbinding time scale. Um, and what we were able to do is provide this sort of underlying mathematical mechanism by showing um, what, what different forces interact at the highest level when looking for an effective uh, equilibrium in an asymptotic perturbation. Um, uh, so by... Uh, by allowing the switching to be fast, you push those terms into the highest order and you recover this time averaging um, and you predict a, a high barrier that would predict long-lived clusters. Um, so then in uh, 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 intermediate scalings, you allow both types of fluctuations to interact with each other. Um, and that uh, effectively lowers the energy barrier and allows for these transitions where really slow um, binding pushes the binding into the lowest lower order. Um, and so you have just a, a thermal equilibrium over a given state um, and you don't have any sort of combined effect of the states in, in time. Uh, Katie, so maybe another four minutes. Okay, yeah. well, I, I'm about done, so thanks. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so 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 we have yeah, so we have this um, equilibrium like uh, distribution um, for a non equilibrium system. Um, so there, so I glossed over the mathematics of that, um, uh, but you can come up with this quasi potential that brings with it all the power of having an actual energy landscape in order to predict metastability and the and the um, expected waiting time for transitions in that landscape. Um, and the, um, what we saw was how the, the time scale can, um, control the size of the fluctuations in the, in the force. Um, so when those fluctuations were small, uh, you ended up with these rigid clusters, uh, whereas when the, the fluctuations were large, you didn't get any kind of combined effect from the fact that you were going between these. Um, and so, um, so that the, that's the part that I think is interesting going going forward is this idea of competition between two different sources of fluctuations. Um, that uh, uh, you know, the first thing one might one tries to do, like this naive time average, you know, like okay, let's get rid of one of the fluctuations and just see the effect of the other. Um, and you might be missing uh, like a, an an important function to the biology, right? So it's not that mm -hmm. biology functions despite the presence of fluctuations, but that the fluctuations might actually be helping biology to function properly by, by allowing it to, to lower these effective energy barriers, allow it to reorganize the genome and be able to access the parts of it that, that it wants to be able to. Um, uh, so, so this work wouldn't be possible without um, the students, Anna Coletti um, and Ben Walker, um, and uh, Carrie Bloom provided lots of great biological insight into this, um, and I had lots of wonderful discussions with Jay Newby about quasi-potentials, um, and uh, thank all of you for your attention, and maybe there's some time for some questions. Thanks so much, Katie. I'm going to clap on behalf of the audience. That was that was really fascinating. Uh, we have a couple of questions already. So Simon had a question. Uh, thanks for the interesting talk. In the fast binding and binding regime, as far as I understand, the pairwise interaction between the beads act as an effective non-specific attraction between beads. Then why do they form multiple metastable clusters instead of collapsing into a single stable cluster? Shouldn't the system effectively be in equilibrium? Sure. Um, yeah. So I think the, like the the upper the upper picture here. Why 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 does it not just all condense down into one giant giant blob? Uh, mm -hmm. 
Um, so it, it it might it might be a a time scale kind of thing, um, but also it's it seems that the there might be a, a size of cluster stability kind of idea going on. Um, cause what, what holds the cluster together, um, is, uh, as I, I think of like herding kittens, like you can only grab one kitten and pull it into your lap and then you have to go grab somebody else and pull them into your lap. So, so you kind of only have the ability to hold so many kittens near, near you before one of them runs off. Um, so as the cluster gets larger and larger, it might be the, the, the beads that are on the outside, there's fewer there's fewer people for them to hold on to um, where the beads on the inside are able to form links all over the place and sort of keep each other close together. But that the outer edge is sort of the first bit that kind of blows off because they don't have as many neighbors to, to, to keep holding hands to. Um, so, so, okay. So that I'm, uh, I'm getting off track. So, so I have two answers. One might be, well, maybe we just didn't wait long enough. Maybe if we waited like a really, really long time, eventually it would all condense. Um, and then the, the second thought is that maybe one giant large cluster is harder to get to than you might think because the outer edges, once the cluster gets to a certain size, the sort of the outer edges seem to not, not bind quite as frequently to things. And so they, they float off join another cluster, they float off, form their own cluster. Um, um, so maybe there's a lot more um, subtleties at work there. Um, and so one of the things that we're working on now is trying to figure out how to push this analysis to larger numbers of beads so that we can investigate things like that, like the, the stability as a function of beads in a cluster. So uh, Peter Kramer has another question. Uh, what is the structure of the quasi potential in the 360 bead system? Is it dependent on all bead positions or is it or can it be reduced to relatively low dimension? Uh, yeah, so we don't we don't yet have a quasi potential for the 361 bead because it would be very difficult to enumerate the probability transition matrix for all the pairwise interactions of all of those. Um, uh, and, and, and so, yeah, so one might, uh try to reduce reduce that we thought about having like a cluster be kind of like a cloud so everybody in the cluster was just kind of a cloud and then ask how stable is it to add a bead to that cloud but haven't haven't gotten anywhere with that analysis yet uh i was just wondering if simon wanted to uh, if simon had a, a follow-up but yeah there's a question from satyam uh, how many forces are modeled and what is the scale of the forces that are modeled? Uh, okay, so I so so let me uh, answer from it in our in our model, we have um, a a confinement potential that's mimicking the the hard wall of of the of the nucleus that just keeps keeps everybody from flying away. Um, there's an ex excluded volume force where if two beads get close together, um, they try to push each other away. Do I have a picture of that? Uh, uh, yeah, here's a here's a picture of the excluded volume force. Um, uh, and then uh, this spring that holds them together. Uh, so I know the this this um this is the fluctuating force the binding and unbinding force um so this force is significantly stronger than the the original force in the large scale model that held the polymer together um so this this force in the large scale model was sort of overpowered the fact that the beads were on, along a string um uh, where the, I think the excluded volume force and the the force along the string more balanced each other to make this act like a polymer. Um, if you 
so 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 the large scale model that I didn't work with, these are actually biologically reasonable uh, uh, parameters that that one can go look at and see how many piconewtons these forces are and stuff like that.